Good evening, everyone. My name is Eileen Sobjack, and I'm the president of the National Federation of Republican Women. Thank you to all of you for joining us tonight with our special guest, Congressman Burgess Owens. Before we get started, just a friendly reminder to please mute your microphones and keep your camera off for the duration of the call. I want to start us out by introducing Sherry Hurt. Sherry is a member of the Texas Federation of Republican Women. She's been the chair of our Regents program for three years. She's done a wonderful job in supporting the NFRW. Sherry, I want to thank you for being here tonight and thank you for all you do. Well, thank you, Eileen, for that wonderful introduction and welcome to all the women here. I'm so excited for you to meet my good friend, Burgess Owens. Um, we are so excited to talk to Burgess Owens tonight. Congressman Owens is a former NFRW, NF, NFRW, <laughs> no, NFL player for the New York Jets and the Oakland Raiders. He won the Super Bowl and with the 1980s Raiders team. And we'll never forget, I'll never forget when he wore his Super Bowl ring to my barn in Texas when I first met him. He is, um, after retiring from the NFL, Congressman Owens worked in the corporate sales world and eventually moved to Utah before being elected to Congress. He started Second Chance for Youth, a nonprofit dedicated to helping troubled and incarcerated youth. Congressman Owens now serves as a member of the House Education and Labor Committee and House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. He believes in dreaming big and following the four guiding principles of faith, family, free markets, and education. We are so honored and excited to have him here today with us. So we just, after he's gonna give us a briefing, you can put some Q and A questions that Eileen will ask him and uh, he will be glad to uh, answer those questions after he talks to us. And we are looking forward to get a firsthand glimpse into the new Republican majority in Congress. I am so happy to give you, and I would like you to join me in giving a warm welcome to my friend, Congressman Burgess Owens. Hey, thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much for that. And uh, just as a, a little little footnote, uh, my mom and dad are Texans, so that might be sure why we connected so well when I we had a chance to meet in Texas. I, I still enjoy getting back uh, to my my home every now and then. Anyway, let me just uh, quickly uh, say before we get started, I, I want to thank everyone that's on right now. We our country is at a point where uh, we need Americans to engage more than ever before, uh, and I'm optimistic because I know our history. That's what we end up doing. We we kind of come out of our little, uh, uh, our freedom zone, a uh, freedom bubble, whenever we really need to see that, that our country's uh, at risk. And, and I want to thank everybody for the, the engagement you have, for the, the uh, whatever you're doing at this point to, to be part of this, this process of winning our country back. Let me let me just start off real quickly with a little football, a little Raiders story. I think that might be a, a good way to, to begin the process. Uh, I played with the Raiders uh, just for seven years, the Raiders for three. And, 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 and I played in the days when the Raiders used to just win football games all the time. We were known for that. Uh, it was something about the culture that was kind of, kind of neat. And that is, it was, a, it was a culture of second chances. It was a place where if you're too old, too rambunctious, too wild, too crazy for the other NFL teams, you just were just right for the Raiders. And, and we all knew that. So by the time most of us were traded or finally got away there, it was kind of our last chance, our second chance and last chance. And so with that came this, this attitude of just giving everything that we, we could to win. The culture that we were part of was something that Al Davis put together. And it, it is, it's, it, the statement, very simply, we all have heard this, just win, baby. It didn't matter what our background was, uh, what our color was, uh, what our history in the NFL was. By the time we got there, our goal was to get on the field and give everything we could uh, during the time we were on that field. And what I remember that year, was actually the previous 12 years before getting to the Raiders, were all losing seasons for me. My last year in high school, four years at the University of Miami, seven years with the Jets, all losing seasons. So by the time I got to the Raiders, uh, I was looking, I was desperate to, to, to get the feeling of what a winner was all about. And thankfully, uh, that year, we had about 11 guys who, who had, were traded that came into, into, the se into the season like I did, and we all just wanted to win. So it was, it was an attitude that we'd do everything we could. Uh, my goal, very simply, as a defensive back, was not to be the weak link. 
I, I didn't want to look at films on some, on Monday morning, realize that, that I made mistakes and I let the team down. And all our, all my teammates felt the same way. So it was a matter of it didn't care who got the credit. Uh, we wanted to put everything on the field, and that's what we ended up doing to, to win that year. And that's kind of where I think we are right now. Uh, we have a, a, a time in our history where we've kind of lived in this little freedom bubble. Uh, we've gone out for years and built our dreams, our, our, our memories, raised our kids, uh, pursued our businesses, vacations. And we had no idea that outside this little freedom bubble was, was danger, was evil. Uh, and we woke up. I think COVID-19 yeah. <clears throat> was, was a chance for us to finally realize yeah. that, um, that we had something we had to, have to, have to be, uh, be aware of. And we woke up. With that, um, I, I'm, I'm thankful to say that, that we now understand that we're, we're at war. And I'm, I'm thankful to be part of that. Uh, I'm thankful for, for you guys who are now tuned in to be part of it. Because what I've learned over his, of, of my, my understanding of history is once we, the people, have come together, we understand that we're, we're truly uh, uh, fighting for our freedom, there's nothing more powerful than that. And whether it be um, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, COVID has been the same way for us. We've woken up and realized, wait a minute, you mean we can't go to work? We can't go to church? Our kids are being uh, uh, indoctrinated? Uh, when we find these things are happening, uh, we don't like it, and we begin to come together like we are right now, and good things begin to happen. So I'm excited about where we are. As, as, uh, as, I, as I was with this team back again in 1980-81, with Super Bowl game, I believe we're in the same position now as a country that Americans no matter what the background is, actually even what's, what side of the aisle we're sitting on, we're realizing that we're experiencing the same pain and we're losing freedom, uh, it seems one day after a time with the, with, uh, with, uh, with the president we have right now. So with that being said, I've never been more optimistic than I am right now about what our future is gonna be about. Um, I watched, I, I was part of the 117th Congress. Uh, I watched the 118th that is now in place. And I'll say this too, for those who kind of kind of keep it up with politics, the last two uh, classes have been remarkable. They are a class of, of, of men and women who truly are there for the right reasons. They're there to fight for our, for our freedom, for our future. Uh, they're not there to be political politicians for the rest of their lives. We're there to, to make a difference. And many of us will do that and go back home and live with the decisions we've made, which I'm excited about that. So um, I'm very, very, again, excited about that process and where we are. So let me just real quickly, I guess highlight a couple of things that that you guys might have noticed. Uh, we had a we had a decision to, uh, to get a speaker, uh, speaking Kevin McCarthy, uh, which I'll, I'll tell you I, I've never seen anyone uh, uh, that has worked as hard in, in politics as I as I watched our, our speaker uh, for the last two years as he's actually worked to get get us back in the majority, and that was kind of shown. You can see that with the the voting process, um, even though it took us 15 rounds to get there. 100% uh, of the conference leadership was voting, was, was, was backing up Kevin, and 98% of the conference uh, backed up Kevin. Now, we, because we're part of such a small majority, there's a good thing with that. With a small majority, we have to make sure that we are listening, we're, we're, we're debating, we're compromising, and coming to the place where we can get to make sure we can move our, our conference forward. Uh, and that's with uh, those that are very, very conservative, those that are, that are in districts that are that might be conservative, but the districts are not. So they have to kind of navigate a little bit differently than, than, than many of us who have very solid dis districts. But at the end of the day, we now know, though, how important it is that we come together and at the end of the day that we, we produce for the American people so that we can come together with bills and, and policies that show that we're heading off in the right direction. Now, with that 15 round votes, keep in mind what you saw. I call it civics one-on-one. Is the way America should be when you have people that have different ways of thinking, uh, different passions, who believe very strongly who they are, and are not going to be demanded, not going to be told what they have to do. It, it's kind of like if you think about the Republican Party, it's because we're entrepreneurs, it's kind of like herding cats. And if you imagine how frustrating that might be if anybody's tried to herd cats, <laughs> it's not an easy task at all. Now, on the other side of the aisle, we have the Democrats which uh, believe in centralized government. They believe in the iron fist, which Pelosi has had for, 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 for a long, long time, for decades. And therefore, every single vote you'll find is one way. Uh, it, it is, it is, there's no way to, to leave the plantation if you want to survive on that other side. So what you saw was really, I think, very helpful for Americans 
to, to realize, and, I, and I've, I've, I've talked to many people who normally would have gone to sleep, but they saw it, they thought, saw, it, saw it as such a interesting process, something I've never seen before, they, they, they stayed up to watch it. So we're gonna see more and more of that. Okay, so one of the things that uh, I wanna just highlight, uh, and I'm not gonna take too much time, I wanna make sure I'm asking questions, but the reason why I feel uh, so optimistic, and, I, and I've always been, is I know my history. Uh, for those who don't know a little bit of my, my background, I, I grew up, uh, I was very fortunate to grow up in the Deep South in the 1960s, the days of KKK, Jim Crow, and segregation. Now, why I say I was fortunate is that my, my community across the country was doing the same exact things that communities across the country, whether it be German or Italian or uh, 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 Asian, it didn't matter what we all had in common, even though at that time we were not assimilating in the 60s, we were segregated. We all believe in our country. We're all very, very proud to be Americans. Uh, we have fathers who just come back from World War II, and they believe in a process of called meritocracy. And because of that meritocracy, we all knew that the only way you can get respect was not by demanding it, not by begging for it, is through commanding it. And that came through winning. So I came from a community that believed very much in winning. Uh, now, again, I, I didn't, I was not introduced to white Americans until I was 16 years old. So all my experience was around black Americans working hard to succeed, working hard to make sure their kids were going to grow up with better opportunities, with more hope about our country and, and making their name their, in their community very, very proud. So that being said, <clears throat> keep this in mind, this is something you're not going to hear from the left because they have, they have hijacked our history. They want us to believe that this is a place that's it's always been just a terrible place to be, that the black community was never a, a community that could ever stand up on, on, on its own and wait for somebody to take care of us. That's what they want us to believe. Well, the, the, the truth of the matter, the community I grew up in, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it was a community that led our country in the growth of the middle class, led our country men matriculated for college, to college because college was our gateway. College was in those days, the way that every person knew that if he got through, they're prepared to go out and, and, and compete and produce and be successful. Uh, we led the country, men, men committed to marriage. Up until 1970, black women could have a higher percentage of marriage than white women did. We also had the highest percentage of, entre uh, uh, percentage of entrepreneurs. <clears throat> Think about a community that's, that's totally segregated, that is not interacting at all with any other community than itself. Think, where, where are the business owners gonna be within the community? So I can still remember as a kid growing up with Baker's Pharmacy, a Speed Grocery Store, Perkins, uh, Perkins Service Station, a, a hospital that, that had nothing but black uh, doctors and nurses, uh, engineers, teachers that were very, very close to my, our, our parents. And the message from every single one of them very simply was, you live in the greatest country in the history of mankind. If you grow up to be a person who uh, respects themselves and others that will serve uh, that will always try to, to give back and hold on to a good name, then you can succeed in this country. So that was the community I grew up in. And when I came out of, uh, when I came out of Tallahassee, 18 years old, going to go to University of Miami, I knew that I could succeed no matter what the struggle might be. So I, I, I want to make that point because that is exactly the heart and soul of what we have to hold on to. We have to make sure that we are telling our true history. We cannot allow the left, the Marxists, to steal our history, switch it around, delete it, make it different, so that we have kids growing up with no, no understanding of who they are, their background, their legacy, and no pride and vision for what their future might be. That's the fight we're, we're fighting now. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I, the, the, the one thing I knew I wanted to do when I got into this position, because I'm one of those guys who never thought I'd, I'd be a politician. When I made the decision to do so, I knew that education was going to be kind of my wheelhouse. Um, so uh, we're now, we have, I'm on the Education and Workforce Committee. I will be the chairman of the subcommittee for uh, higher education and also a subcommittee for pre-K through 12. So uh, I'll be part of that, that entire supply chain from, from kindergarten all the way through college. How can we make sure we're disrupting this, this, this educational system so that we're once again teaching our kids how to critically think and be proud of who we are and understand the danger of socialism and Marxism and what that godless ideology does to every single one that it touches. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about being part of that process and kind of pulling our country back. Um, let me just say this before I open up questions. Um, I'm very proud to be part of the, the 117th and 118th class. Uh, you, you the, the American people, uh, have sent to Congress 
men and women who are there for the right reasons. And I can't say that enough. I'm very so proud to be in meetings where we're talking about how can we make sure we get our kids back to make sure they can learn again. How we make sure we protect and provide an, an, an environment so our business can thrive without all the regulations, without, without all the things that, that's been coming after them uh, as, as it is. How can we make sure that we get back to basic common sense, the common sense in biology, <laughs> that men and girls and boys cannot switch themselves to a different agenda because they, they decide they want to. Things like this that we have to make sure we're standing strong for and strong and, 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 and standing against, standing against what's happening with China right now, that, uh, that we've allowed our desire for profits. Too many people in this country have allowed their desire for profit to, to uh, outweigh patriotism. So we have so, so many businesses, and NFL is one of them, by the way, NBA is another. That's why I don't watch NFL today. I don't watch any games. I, I missed the one last night because I see them as traitors to our cause, to, to our country, uh, when they care more about profits, than they care about uh, um, standing up for who we are and making sure that we as a country are coming together as the game should be, as opposed to dividing us uh, as they've done in the last couple of years. So, so that being said, I, I'm excited that that we're at where we are. I'm excited for opportunities like this. Uh, history will, at the end of the day, not so much focus on what the Congress did, but what we the people did to make sure we had the representation that would get our country back to what it is. So by you tying in, tying in tonight, uh, uh, your, your, your efforts to, to help in any way you can, whether it be um, uh, getting out and talking with people, whether it be donating uh, to the cause to, to make sure you can support what we're doing, Whatever you're doing right now, as, as I talked about uh, with my, the Raider team, that the, every second we're on our field, we gave everything we could give. And when at the end of the day, we do that, we, look, we, we feel good about ourselves, that we were part of, that, of, of the solution, part of the answers. And uh, I'm excited about, about, about being part of that process and, and joining with you guys to, to make sure we just keep our country moving in the right direction and, and, and take it back from those who have hijacked it over, over, the, last, over, the, over the last few decades. So with that being said, I think I've talked enough. I'm gonna oh, just answer great. some questions if you guys don't mind, if we can do that. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, Congressman Owens, thank you so much. And I just thank you for your, um, your commitment to faith, family and freedom and what you're doing. And we are here to do whatever we can to help you and assist. One of the questions is that, uh, that came up with, with so many bills and initiatives, what's your, I know what's your general main priority, but what's the main priority um, with some of these bills, like right now? I think, well, there's a, there's a lot of things. I, this last, uh, this first Congress, I was part of the judici judici judiciary and of course, part of the uh, education and that time labor. Uh, I, I've always felt very simply, when you look at uh, where our attack is gonna be, uh, all we have to do is go back in history and, 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 and just remember what our friends and enemies have said. It was uh, Karl Marx who said, the first battlegrounds we write in history. Why is stealing our history so important for the heartless, godless left? Because if they steal our history, they steal our appreciation for the present, our, our vision for the future, and, and everything that's, that's happened to get us to where we can be really proud of who we are. They steal that from us when they can take our history. So they're good at that. The other thing is John Thomas Jefferson said, ignorant and free can never be, to paraphrase. So they understood as our founders how important education is, how important it to be able to read and write to think. And, and to, to debate, the, mm -hmm. the, the key process of, of having different thoughts is not that we have to agree together. We have enough confidence in ourselves that we can talk to somebody else. They might not agree with us, but in our mind, we think, well, if given time, by being me nice, my, my, by me being nice, by me being respectful and coming with more better thoughts, I can convince that person to come my way. Now, if everybody's thinking that way, we have a very respectful dialogue. If you're not, if it's all about emotion, you're gonna pick up a stick, and hit somebody. And that's what the left does. They take away any kind of thought. They take away any kind of common sense because they believe that they are truly the source of all truth. And as we know, that is that is the worst thing anybody can think of. It's godless. And uh, when you, you can have truth that just sways with the wind and with whoever's in power, you're gonna have a, a nothing but chaos and our country cannot survive. Nothing can survive with chaos. So um, so I would say this, my, my legacy, and we've talked about this over the, this last year with my team, is, uh, is education. It's, it's, it's being a part of disrupting the present educational system so that when our kids can come out of school, first of all, they don't all have to go to six-year college. 
They come out and get into what they want to because they've been trained and exposed. They know, they know there's a lot of money can be made and a lot of respect can be made by producing and giving back. And they come out and produce without all this debt, without being indoctrinated. And if, if, if I could be part of that legacy, then I would have felt this, this, this time uh, would have been well worth it, the process, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. One of the questions had related to that was um, about, uh, you know, focusing on trade schools. And uh, so what do you think about that trade schools and our, <laughs> our, um, our electricians, our plumbers, our yes. welders? Seems like, yes. um, you know, we don't uh, we don't have as many of, of those that are that can produce and we need that. Well, and that's that is part of the uh, the attack that we've had to go through the last hundred years. Uh, there's a book that I read, uh, Pete Hesek came out with a couple months ago, so that's called The Battle for the American Mind. And uh, if you have kids or grandkids in the school system, which most of us do, I would really highly recommend Battle for the American Mind. And what you find out is that it's been a slow process of the elitists uh, putting the, the respect in one way only. They, they have taught us to believe that the only way you can get respect and be successful, truly successful, is go to a four-year college, come out with this degree, and the, 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 the higher the degree, the more successful and respected you'll be. Meanwhile, our country is run by people who roll up their sleeves. Many do not have a high school, I mean, a big degree. They, they, know, they know how to do what they do best, and they're business owners. I'll say this. Once we teach our young people, once again, that the key to our, our nation is business owners, because business owners is powers the middle class. And our middle class is where our culture that I, that I, that I talk about, faith, family, free market education, the middle class is that class that really adheres to that. They want to, they want to they, because they understand it, they have empathy for it, and they teach their kids that process. So we have to make sure that middle class, which is powered by the, middle, by the business owners, are continuing to strive. And, um, and we'll do that by teaching the trade, vocational, and uh, having our, our young people coming out uh, being productive very, very quickly. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, um, I've had a couple questions in regard to the recent activity with the Chinese spy balloon. And um, what, what do you say that American can do better to secure its presence in the world as a superpower? Um, what do we need to do here? Okay, well, it, it comes down to this. Um, we have to do more of what we're doing right now. Uh, American people, once educated and once engaged, uh, there's nothing more powerful than that. Uh, if we're not educated and we're, we're being indoctrinated, we're going to elect official, officials that do exactly what they're doing right now. They allow us to be weak. They allow the borders to be wide open and people to be hurt and killed and, and lose their hopes and dreams. You have to understand we're, what we're fighting is, is not a right versus left. It's a spiritual battle. And, and that battle began from the very beginning with a God who gave us this idea of freedom in a, in a country that's built on freedom and faith. And we have to continue, know that that's a fight, continual fight that we're going through. The other side wants to take that away. So we have a, we have a force, China, the communists, the godless uh, ideology that that uh, is. You talk about uh, main uh, taking away people's freedom, hopes, lives. You, you can't get any worse than communism, Marxism, and, and socialism. And so we're under attack right now. It's going to take good leaders leaders to fight back. So we, the people, have to be engaged. And have to start electing folks who understand what we're up against and want to protect our kids and our future uh, and, and not continue to send people to Congress that, uh, who had just an example, we had a bill uh, that actually uh, called out the, um, I don't know the name of it, called out socialism for what it is, a, a terrible, terrible ideology. And it was very simple. We asked for Congress to, to point out that, that socialism was evil. Well, we had 169 Democrats who voted against that resolution and 15 that voted present. So we have to understand in our Congress right now, we have people that cannot stand up for free market that will instead think that, uh, uh, that socialism is okay. So we have to elect the right, the right folks. And a long answer to a short question, we need to elect the right people and we the people can do that. Okay. I guess we just have time for one more question, although I could just listen to you uh, all night long, <laughs> and I really enjoyed when you spoke to us at the um, the Western Conference with the women in um, in Las Vegas, and that was great too. Given um, everyone's concern about inflation, who do you say is responsible for this record-breaking <laughs> economic crisis, and what can we do to get America? 
back on track? Inflation is very, very simple. It's when we spend too much, uh, there's, there's too much money uh, out, out in, in the work in workplace so that money's being devalued. We're seeing it uh, when you have the, the type of debt we're now looking at, $31 trillion in debt that we're passing to our children. Uh, I'll say this, what the upside of watching the last two years is we're having conversations that Americans have not had in a long time. We've not talked about education because we just took for granted our kids will be educated just fine and we'll be okay. Well, now we're talking about it. We're now talking about CRT and evils that we have to get out and, and getting good teachers into the system who really love teaching versus indoctrination. We're now talking about inflation uh, to see the impact on that. So it comes down to this, and, and this, is, this is one of the things that happened in, in the State of the Union uh, when Biden made the point that Republicans were trying to, to stop Medicare and Social Security. Notice the reply from the Republican Party. I was so proud of that. I'm proud that we did not sit there silently and just be nice. We made it very clear that he was telling a big lie and he had to respond to it. American people need to know that this guy is not honest, that he's doing the things that turn our country upside down. And the, the, the way these, that he, the, these bills they're passing, the money they're, they're spending, it does, it does just it does the worst for us and that, that can happen. So at the end of the day, it's, we're going to have a conference that's going to start pushing back on this, on this spending spree. We now have majorities. So we can show how that works out. Just, I will say this, the best thing you can do is be engaged. Tune in. We have now committee hearings uh, going to be throughout uh, throughout this year. Please turn on tune in. As many of these you can you can tune into so you understand what's really going on. And therefore, you can speak truth to power when you talk to your friends, when you when you go to vote, you know what you're voting for. And you can stand up for, uh, for the direction we're going in. So educate yourself and know that uh, we're fighting a fight that we can win. We just, as long as the American people are part of the process. All right, okay. Well, thank you. And like I said before, we are here to assist and help. We have a legislative committee. Our women are very politically engaged. So anything we can do to work together to make America better, we are here to do that. I wanna thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for the sacrifice you make in serving I know all of us here at NFRW are looking forward to more victories from you in our House Republican Conference in, co in Congress. Let me just say this as we end this, this, this conversation. As I mentioned before, uh, <clears throat> history will be looked back on we the people at this moment, at this, this time in history where we're going to make decisions to do things and be engaged like you're, you're talking about you guys are right now. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, sometimes it's not herald. But at the end of the day, it is what makes a difference and makes sure our country moves forward. So thank you guys for, for your efforts, your, your, your time, and your love for our country. And, and we're going to come out of this okay. So, and, and as Al Davis used to say, just win, baby. We'll get this thing done with. <laughs> okay. right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. See you later. All right. Bye-bye. Right. I want to thank all our valuable members for joining us today. And I just want to remind you that in order for the NFRW to provide this exclusive programming and events like this, we need support from members like you. I encourage you all to join our Regents program. Our coordinator of donor relations, Nadia, is going to provide some brief information on how you can join. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Eileen. If you have any questions about the program, you are welcome to use the chat function. Um, but the, like Eileen mentioned, the Regents program is a great way to further your involvement with the NFRW and support our growth. But there are now easy and new payment options that are on our website at NFRW org slash regions. I'm going to put a code on the screen shortly. Um, but now you can become a regent for just $85 a month. We, we also offer quarterly, biannual, and annual payment options. Um, so it is as easy as getting on your smartphone um, and scanning the code on your screen. And um, with our spring board meeting coming up in the next month, now is the best time to join. We have many, many wonderful um, programming that we are planning for our regents. Um, and so I really encourage you all to join. Um, if you have any questions, you are also welcome um, to email regents at nfrw.org. Thank you, Eileen.
Thank you, Nadia. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, to there. I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I hope all of you consider supporting NFRW as a regent. And if you have any additional questions or you'd like to pay over the phone, you can call the NFRW office. And thank you again for all that you do, ladies, to support our great country and have a wonderful evening. Good night.